This is my title for it. Assessment, Treatment, Understanding Path of Mechanics. Um, I base this on multiple articles and also other research I did for this presentation. So it's not just from this one article, but the one article I did really like was Gluteal Tendinopathy, Integrating Path of Mechanics, Clinical Features, and its Management. Um, Dr. Grimaldi is a specialist in the hip. Um, and Dr. Fearon, I think that there's some really good info. This, it's, the, the studies are from 2015 and on. So it's, it's more recent research. So I think it'd be really good for us to um, understand what they found in the research and how we could integrate that into our treatments. So um, this is her article, one of them that I based our information on and I could send uh, the articles out to you guys in uh, an email. So uh, basically we're really looking at lateral hip pain. And when we talk about lateral hip pain, most of the diagnoses in the past are, are bursitis, right? So you have the trochanteric bursa, you have the glute med bursa, you know, uh, we don't say this often, we have iliopsoas bursa, ischial gluteal bursa. I mean, what's the point of a bursa? Like, why is a bursa there? This is where we have the answers. Why do we have a bursa? Come on, people. A bursa. To reduce friction on the uh, site. Exactly. Thank you, CJ. So, um, so exactly. So basically, you know, what happens is it's usually on a bony prominence, right? And we want to reduce the friction on that bony prominence. So if you have a, if you have a muscle uh, that turns into a tendon, obviously it goes down to bone, wherever that friction is going to occur, that's where the bursa is. So, so there is a bursitis, right? I and mean, that does happen. So what, what muscles we're looking at is we're really trying to focus on a few muscles. Obviously you have the, the glute max. We're not really talking about the glute max, right? We remove that and we're looking at the gluteus medius. Okay, we'll hide that one. And here's the gluteus minimus underneath it, right? And then the piriformis. Now, gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, what are they? Are they external rotators or are they internal rotators? External. External. Everybody, uh, I know everybody's gonna say external, right? Well, trick question, uh, oh. because they are external rotators, but they're also internal rotators, okay? So when you bring your femur up past 60 degrees toward 90 degrees, because the orientation of that muscle, of those muscles, they turn from external rotators to internal rotators. This is very, very important. This is not just a cool fact you can tell your friends and sound like you're smart. There's a reason for this, and into the special test that we're gonna do today and talk about, we're looking at how that impacts the All right, so let's go back to our screen. Okay, so uh, what I wanna do is I wanna talk about uh, some of the forces that tendons withstand, okay? So first, we talk about tensile stress, right? Tensile is a normal stress, right? If you picture the quad tendon, Pulling the quad tendon uh, from uh, superior to inferior, that's good tensile stress. Loading that, that tendon is healthy, and you need to load the tendon. The tendon loaded is going to improve the tendon integrity. So I'm going to say this over and over again, but when we have a patient who has a tendinopathy, or you think of bursitis, which will go in more detail, don't make it passive. It has to be an active, progressive loading because that's what improves tendon integrity. And we'll talk about some tricks to do that. Now, if there's too much abnormal load and it occurs too quickly, right? So somebody, for example, starts running and all of a sudden they're in a running routine and it's, it, it, they didn't progress slowly, that's adding too much load quickly. But abnormal load, so let's, let's talk about this example here of the glute mean glute min. If you, go into hip adduction, that puts more stress and pull on the tendon. So, so a biomechanical position by pulling on a tendon further and then loading it, that's abnormal load also. So, so we're looking at biomechanics that directly influences the tendon and tendon's health. So like we said, tensile load is that pull, like you take a TheraBand, you pull it apart, that's tensile load. This is the big one because you hear a lot about compressive load. 
So compressive load, like obviously, you know, compression is if you take your finger into a muscle belly or a tendon and push down. Well, that's compression, of course. But when you talk about compressive load, that's an attendant when it wraps around a bony protuberance. So for example, the glutamine glutamin, they, the tendons wrap over the greater trochanter during hip adduction, right? So when you adduct that hip, those tendons move over the, uh, the troch and that is compressive load. Another example of compressive load could be an Achilles tendon. When the Achilles wraps over the calcaneus, that's compressive load. Remember we talked about um, when we looked at the foot, uh, what, what do we have here that's a compressive load? What do we have here? What's that? Peronius longus or uh, if we go on the other side, oops. If you go on the other side, you have posterior tib, right? If you have posterior tib tendon, that's a compressive load. So when we have the tendons that are round protuberances, and then you have excess pronation, so this whole thing drops down, what's gonna happen to that posterior tip? That compressive load is gonna cause tendon damage, possibly, if we don't teach the tendon how to handle load, and if we don't change the biomechanics. So I think that's the take home point. Um, and then we have shear and friction load. So that's like a continuous rubbing against the, two, the, the bony prominence. So for example, like the Achilles tendon when you're swimming or biking, you never store energy. So like when you squat down and you jump up, that squat is storing energy in the muscle belly and tendon. And when you push up, that stored energy is helping you with it. But when you're you know, swimming and you're going to plantar flexion, dorsiflexion really quickly, there's no stored energy. So that's shear and friction load, which also causes issues. So the question is, when you see a patient, I mean, think right now, you must have a patient right now who has a bursitis, right? Is it a bursitis? And that's the question. So what we looked at in these latest studies, here's one example. They had 75 individuals with symptoms of pain and point tenderness over the greater trochanter. Okay, so you'd think that's a bursitis. But, but only eight had bursal enlargement. Like they did this under MRI and they dulcet them as well. But the majority of them had gluteus medius tendinopathy and more severe cases had some tendon tears, usually the deep uh, and, and anterior portion of the tendon. So 75 patients, eight had bursitis. So at like 10% almost. Uh, another study, 877 people with great trochanteric pain had only 20% bursal thickenings on ultrasound. So that means that between 10 and 20% of your patients that say, hey, it hurts with my greater trochanter, it's actually bursa. And it doesn't mean if it's bursa, it doesn't mean it's not a tendinopathy also. But that's pretty low, I think lower than I thought in the past. And so the research supports that the lateral hip pathology is a gluteal tendinopathy more than a bursitis. And why that's important is because treatments are more active. You do not want to have a patient laying on the table and you just, you know, squeezing and pushing into their, uh, into their uh, tendon or muscle belly. I mean, that's not bad, but you need to actively load, which we'll talk about what the research says. Can I ask you a question? So a couple of risks. Yeah, yeah. please. Um, yeah. Can you back the slide? In terms of yes. diagnostically, um, like, I mean, bursal thickening, we talk a lot about imaging and how um, just because there's pathology, oh, you know, you know, or something found on imaging. Um, is bursal thickening, is that like a pretty specific form of diagnosing bursal pain? Like, does it, does it have to be, you know, be thickening or something like that on imaging? Or can, it, can the pain still come from the bursa without any imaging findings? Um, great question. I think, I think the way I'm hearing it, what, what, I, what my answer is, you could have bursal thickening and bursal enlargement uh -huh. and the and that does not mean that the bursa is the uh, pain pr provocator, right? Correct. So all these patients that have bursal thickening or bursal enlargement on MRI or on um, ultrasound doesn't mean necessarily even that's where their pain's coming from. Okay. But there's a pathology there because you have this continual friction of the tendon over the bursa, so it's thickened it. That could have been thickened years ago and you had no pain. So. Mm. So it's a great point. It doesn't mean that that's the actual problem at all, but it 
what it does say is if you have 75 people or you have 877 people that all say they have pain over their over their bursa, which we always used to think when I graduated 25 years ago, th that was like, oh, well, yeah, it's a bursa, uh, ice, ultrasound. I mean, it was it was not good, but that's how we looked at it. So so it doesn't mean that that's, it's a bursal issue, even if it shows 10 to 20% of the patients have bursal thickenings. Okay. So did that answer your question? Um, yeah, I have follow-up questions, but I don't want to ask them too early. <laughs> well, we do have more, there's more uh, diagnostic stuff in here, so we might get to your answers. So if we don't, you know, feel free to ask. Great question. So real quick, risk factors. They find that females over 40 years old are more uh, likely to have a gluteal tendinopathy. There could be issues, they found issues. I don't wanna go into it with uh, different um, congenital changes of, of how the femur sits and, 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 and you know, the, the angles, but we can't change that, so I don't wanna focus on that. But they did find that up to 35% of the patients with the gluteal tendinopathy also had um, low back pain. So I think that was, that was important. Some causative factors or presentations, they have pain with stairs or hills. There's definitely pain over the grade trochanter. They have pain lying on their lying on their trochanter. Again, does not mean that it's a bursa. It means that is a pathology that we'll call gluteal tendinopathy. So the diagnosis, I think uh, Carter was asking about the diagnosis, and they did a lot of reviews looking at ultrasound versus MRI. And the author suggests that ultrasound was the better choice because it's fewer false positives. Now it it's less expensive, it's easier to do, less invasive as far as radiology goes, so uh, that's good. Um, but the MRI provides a lot more information about adjacent structures. So, you know, we'll, we probably will be seeing more ultrasound diagnostics than we will uh, MRIs. So, pathomechanics. Um, I think it's important to look at, like the hip and the shoulder, I mean, they are close, right? So, the, you look at the structures, they move differently, different ranges of motion. But for example, the glute med is very similar to the supraspinatus. So if you think of it that way, they both have deep undersurface tears. That's how they present on their uh, tendinopathies. And the gluteal tendinopathy is like most insertion tendinopathies. So when we're talking about gluteal tendinopathy today, think of this as we're talking about Achilles tendinopathy and, um, and patella tendinopathy. Anytime you have an insertion tendinopathy, which is called an enthesopathy, we've talked about this in the past, the enthesopathies are basically, you know, boned tendon. That irritation of pulling that tendon on the bone can irritate either at that bony insertion site or on the tendon or on the friction area where the compressive load is occurring, okay? And this is due to that longitudinal and transverse compressive load. And what happens over time when you continue to have, have this, this increased uh, uh, compressive load, the matrix degrades and that predisposes you to more tearing under a lower tensile load. That's why PT is so important to change those mechanics so we're not at a um, higher likelihood of these issues. And uh, this is really interesting. Um, if you stand on one leg, we really want to use mostly the glute med and glute min. They call those the trochanteric abductors. But if you stand on one leg, 30%, 30% of the force comes from the tensor fascia lata, the vast lateralis, and the upper fibers of the glute max, right? 30%, this is in normal people. 70% comes from glute med, glute min. What happens if that switches and 70% comes from these, right? So when you have a patient exercising, this is good to follow, if you have a patient complaining of like lateral thigh pain or not pain, but even muscle activation, like, oh, I feel me outside my leg or toward vas lateralis, tensor fascia lata, um, that could be that they're using these muscles when they should be using the glute med and glute min. And we don't want that, okay? The glute med and min can't stabilize alone the pelvis, so these have to kick in, but they should be a 70 to 30. Okay, and we'll talk about how to get that with patients. So, okay, so you have a patient walks in and you're trying to decide what's going on. Well, we need to know, I mean, is it bursa? Is it gluteal tendinopathy, right? First of all, we know 80% to 90% is gluteal tendinopathy just by looking at those studies, okay? And if it is bursa, we still are treating this anyway because we want an active treatment plan. But then we know, is it intra-articular pain? 
like osteoarthritis, ephemeral acetabular impingement, or avast necrosis, right? We have to rule these out because those treatments are definitely different. Um, or is it extra articular outside the joint capsule? And we'll go over this, ischial femoral impingement, quadratus, quadratus femoris tear. Or is the lumbar radiculopathy or referred pain, or maybe inflammatory disease like rheumatoid arthritis. So we'll go through these and how to differ differentially diagnose those. So intraarticular. First of all, typically there's some kind of trauma, right? So look back at their history. Typically they have pain with putting shoes and socks on. Okay, so it's like an OA patient or an FAI when they flex and rotate. Usually there's some pain there. Um, Sometimes a history of cortisone use for alcohol abuse, and that could be a vast necrosis. Um, here's what's important. If it's intraarticular, pain is reported in one or more of these areas. So the groin, okay? So a, let's let, let be clear, a gluteal tenopathy, you do not have groin pain, right? Deep buttock, really deep buttock, no, but I, that could be confusing. Anterior thigh for intraarticular, uh, gluteal tenopathy does not have anterior thigh, and or knee. So if you have pain in, in, in one or more of those areas, that's more likely intraarticular. But what, what tests do we do? The gold standard, believe it or not, is a hip passive intraltation test. You know, you could try them prone and ha check intraltation there. You can try them supine at 90 and try intraltation there. Those are usually quite painful. But passively, will that be uh, causing pain just with a passive intraltation? Um, no, especially if you understand the mechanics of, glu of, of the gluteus minus the medius, you can test them in intraltation and you'll know that, that most likely that's going to be pain uh, with intraltation for a intraarticular issue. They'll usually have decreased range of motion, especially with osteoarthritis down the road. They have hip locking, giving way, clicking the groin, and then flexion adduction, internal rotation. That's the other gold standard test. So those are two tests right here that you'll be doing, internal rotation and faders, okay? Now, extra articular. So let's talk about this. So we're looking at ischiofemoral impingement or quadratus femoris. So just to review, this right here is the quadratus femoris, okay? This is, the, this is post, looking posteriorly, right? So this is where we're talking about having either a strain uh, or a further tear. Um, so pain over the quadratus femoris or, uh, or ischial femoral region, that's not happening if you have a glute med to glute min issue, right? Some of them have snapping sensation over this uh, interval, the ischial femoral interval with walking or running. Uh, again, you might get a patient who has pain so right deep into here. Well, what, what is that? Well, that's what it could be. If we talk about piriformis, the piriformis also, um, the piriformis also is uh, right over here, and that can compress sciatic nerve, which causes different pain down the leg, but not usually laterally. Okay. And pain with sitting uh, actions or repetitive load, the hip external rotators may have sciatic-like symptoms. Any questions so far? Are you guys still there? I had a question. Yes. Um, so it's about, well, when you're talking about single leg stance and like the 70, 30% breakdown, is that what is ideal or is that what we're seeing in patients with gluteal tendinopathy? That is what you're seeing in normal patients. So that is what you want to see. And we'll talk about as an exercise specialist or as a PT, how to try a bias, the glute meat and min over those other structures. So that's a good question. Robin, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. So then um, would the numbers be flipped? Like, so instead of like 70-30, um, it's like 30-70, or do they meet somewhere in the middle? You know, I can't say, because no studies show uh, that I know of what, what, how that flips, but they'll definitely have a different ratio, right? You'll see that they, they, they have a different movement pattern. And that changes the ratio. So it doesn't mean it flips, but it might be different. That's just one part of it. That's not, mm -hmm. that's not the end all be all. So we'll, we'll get to that. That's a good question. Okay. Thank you. Um, so sure. So inflammatory disease like rheumatoid arthritis, you know, just thinking, you know, we do have patients that are undiagnosed with systemic arthritis. So for example, there's usually like uh, heat and edema over areas and multiple areas, right? 
you usually have joint stiffness uh, in the morning that lasts longer than one hour, right? After one hour, that's usually arthritic changes, but after an hour, you know, and they say three, four hours, I mean, that you need to start thinking could be systemic arthritis. They usually have symmetrical signs, usually bilaterally, usually hands are involved, and sometimes there's GI dysfunction involved with that. So just to make sure that if you think somebody's RA and they show these other signs, there are simple blood tests they could do to look at rheumatoid factors just to see if that's what it is. So let's go over radiculopathy. So here's my question for you guys. If we want to rule out a lumbar radiculopathy and we want to see that it's lumbar versus um, hip joint, what are some tests that we do? Well, uh, slump, yes, uh, I love the slump test. Slump test is great. Um, we'll do a whole other presentation on lumbar tests when we're in person so we can really go through them again. We've done it before, but slump test is a really good one, one of my favorites. Um, that's, uh, I, I like that sensitive and specificity of those. Yes, what else? Straight leg. Straight leg raise, excellent. What, what, what is like the straight leg raise test, but another one that's really important. Cross straight leg raise, wow, yeah. okay? So um, keep, keep bringing them, I'll, I'll talk as you go, but reflex testing. Reflex testing is really important, okay? There's a high interrater liability. <laughs> we wanna make sure there's no major um, issues there. You could do, of course, myotomes, and then dermatome testing is really important as well. So those are our you know, hard signs that we're looking at. And then a quadrant or compression tests, you know, when you test a patient for a quadrant compression test, you really, my suggestion is, it's not the gold standard, but it's the easiest way to do it. Have them sitting on the edge of the table and have them in an extended position so they're already, they're, 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 their hips are, are lower, they're, the table's higher up, so now they can't be in lumbar flexion and put them into the anti-pelvic tilt and then try to extend and rotate, rotate, into the side bend, rotate to the right, an extension, and side bend, rotate to the left, an extension. So you're closing down the facet, and then you're closing down the foramina, and then maintain that, and you can even add some compression to it, okay? So you really wanna make sure that now, if you did that, and that caused some glute pain, that is not coming from the, the gluteals, the gluteal tendinopathy, right? So I would definitely make sure you go through these tests reflex and dermatomes, you can do myotomes as well, and then check your quadrant and compression tests. Straight leg raise, like Greg said, and then cross straight leg raise. So this cross straight leg raise is, is, is a higher sensitivity specificity showing for pain on the opposite side. So make sure you check both sides. The slump tests, like we said, the modified braggards we talked about before, that's like a bowstring test. There's actually a study last year that was um, a higher sensitivity and specificity, about 70% for each, that looked at a more of an acute issue, more of an acute herniated disc possibly, where you sort of bowstring them, they're supine, legs up to, uh, hips up to 90 degree flexion, you start to extend the knee up into more extension, and then you push your fingers up a popliteal space, you also instantly rotate, and you sort of tension that sciatic nerve, and as you push in the popliteal space, that tension can pull up against the, uh, the, the disc um, and the nerve pushes against the disc, which will cause some pain. Uh, again, that's only acute patients, but it's another test that's a possibility. So I do want to talk about sensitivity and specificity for the gluteal tendinopathy. So we go, we go over this every time, but I want to make sure we're clear on this. Sensitivity rules something out, okay? The only sensitive test for gluteal tendinopathy is palpation. So if you palpate the gluteal tendons, that's muscle belly, but down toward the tendons to insertion site, and they're not tender, there's a very high likelihood that it is not gluteal tendinopathy. Okay, so you can rule out gluteal tendinopathy if the palpation is negative. Now, here's for specificity, right? This rules it in, okay? So the, test, the best test is using this Fader's test with, with resistance. This is part of the part of the study they did. I don't know who this guy is, but I thought it was a good video to show what we're gonna be doing. But it's the Fader's test with resistance. So remember, when you go into hip flexion up to 90 degrees, what does the glute mean men do? Do they externally rotate or internally rotate the femur? 
internally. Thank you, Carter. Internally rotates the femur, right? So you have to test that muscle with resisted internal rotation, okay? So let's, let's look at this test. Flex the hip to 90 degrees. Do you hear the volume or no? So you adduct, external rotation you external rotate the leg, range. and now, now you have the patient push into internal, internal rotation, so pushing resistance. into that guy's hand. Do you guys see that? So you put them to flexion, flex them up, adduct them in, uh, excellently rotate them, and then they resist and push into internal rotation. Now, if you do that right now, if you're sitting down and you pick your leg up and bring it in and adduct it, and then you, and then you try to push your, your lateral mal malleolus away, right? So you internal rotate your leg at that point, you're gonna feel your glute, your glute min. If you do the opposite, you feel the uh, opposite side of the femur of muscles contracting. So you can feel that when you do it. Now, when you do this, its sensitivity is 44%, which is not awesome, but its specificity is 93%. So if this is a positive test, there's a 93% likelihood that you have a gluteal tendinopathy. So I think that's a, that's a good test to, to do. So the most specific test, which is the easiest one of all, is a single leg stand for pain. They, did a, they looked at uh, tons of tests across the board when they looked at this study, and they found that the single leg stance test for pain was the best one. And you're gonna have people who are unbalanced. And the pa patients who really the worst balance actually had consistent findings with hip OA, intraarticular issues, or tendinopathy. So, so even not being able to stabilize was one of the findings that possibilities that you have a pathology in there. But if you had the patient, this is the way they found it worked best. Let's say your right leg's on the ground, your left foot's behind you, your left finger is just touching just for stability, and you have to wait 30 seconds or less, but as soon as the pain begins. You go at least 30 seconds. If there's no test, if there's, sorry, if there's no pain, the test is negative. And that means that there's a very high likelihood by looking at sensitivity is 100, right? Or specificity is 97%. Um, very high likelihood that the pain must be over the gray trochee in gluten medium men that that if it's there, that is a, a positive test for the hip pathology. Now, when you do this, take home point, make sure you ask the patient, where do you feel your pain? That increases the sensitivity of each test. Don't tell them that you feel there. Like say, where do you feel it? And by them telling you where, that improves the sensitivity of these tests. Um, and then um, it doesn't necessarily tell you if it's intra-articular or if it is a gluteal tendinopathy, um, but both groups had poor balance, like I mentioned, as compared to the asymptomatic group. Um, so here's what we talked about. If, you, if the person has poor glute, mid and mean, mean and min strength and function, they could fall into hip adduction. And this can cause tendon compression. So, when we're having somebody stand and balance and stabilize, if they're going to the adduction, you're increasing the tensile load of that tendon and that's causing a problem. So make sure that when you're exercising, we're not going to hip adduction. So <clears throat> they did another study uh, two years ago where they looked at what you can give patients and how they did and just educating patients alone helped 30% of patients, just education. So I thought this was good. Now you notice, obviously you don't want to stand on one leg. You don't want your hips crossed, but how about this? How many patients with a glute tendinopathy or, or piriformis syndrome um, or a, you know, bursitis are stretching. Stretching is not indicated for a tendinopathy. It is not indicated. You do not want to stretch. That causes more issues. You bring more tensile or compressive load through that tendon. So avoid the stretching and tendinopathy. Cross legs, knees are in, um, and these positions are all not good. Then sleeping positions. This is the worst position, right? This side, you're compressing the hip. This side, you're adducting and internally rotating. So that's not good, right? Best position is supine. Legs, legs are flex, slightly abducted hips. Um, they can't do this, this with multiple, most people can't. They usually snore on their back. Uh, side lying with the pillows between the knees. I know you all know that. But these are the things you're giving your patient as information. So we go to, 
Is there a question? Yeah, sorry, not a question. Um, Chelsea is, I guess, got logged out of the meeting and wants to be let back in. Okay, let's see. Sorry, thank you. Let's participants. All right, I think Chelsea back in now. Okay, are you guys back uh, back in the screen? Can I make a Can quick you Kale, or just yeah. just comment? Because um, we know about tendinopathies that they have different stages, right? There's like the reactive stage where things are real painful. Um, but for a higher level patient, like say you have a runner who has gluteal tendinopathy, um, you know, like obviously, like it, it, it's more so like clustering tests, right? The single leg stance test probably won't light them up. Um, but if you do more functional stuff or things where like, you know, there's a little more, um, like endurance plays a role, fatigue plays a role, stuff like that. Um, the, I assume that that study was more so for like kind of a reactive group, more acute tendinopathy. Yep. Great question. Yeah. So if you have a patient, so what I always say with their high level patients, I'm like, Hey, uh, if you're a runner and you have this possible tendinopathy, go run. And when you feel pain, normally for that for 20 minutes, don't come into my clinic until it's like 18 or 19 minutes. And then come in and then we'll load you up. And then you can get a better idea. So yeah, Carter, these are, these are, these are uh, patients that have reactive um, symptoms. These aren't the, um, <clears throat> the higher level people, but the treatments go to a higher level. So this, so this could be a higher level runner and the treatments we're talking about are gonna work, but they catch them in an earlier stage. So it talks about here, uh, and by the way, cluster signs are the key. I can't say it enough. We're not taking one test and doing one test. Oh, that's it. That's what you are. Uh, cluster the different tests together to get your proper diagnosis. That is essential. So good point, Carter. So uh, here's what's really important. So we talk about low load isometrics, and I don't know if everybody does a ton of this. We talked about in our last meetings about some isometrics and pain relief. Well, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll reintroduce that a little bit, but um, what these people did, we got really great results, is they made sure to gentle glute med min activation in isometrics. Um, so they want to relax, like we said, the TFL, the upper glute max, and the vasolateralis, lateralis, and slowly introduce the glute med and min in an isometric uh, fashion. So basically, the idea of isometrics, you activate segmental and extra-segmental descending pain inhibitory pathways at low-level contraction. So a 25% in this study, a 25% maximal voluntary contraction was helpful in raising pain thresholds. So they found that that was more helpful than a high-intensity contraction of like 80% isometric contraction. So with this type of patient load, this is the reactive patient load, if you do a 25% isometric contraction, they found that they had pain relief, actual pain relief, right? That lasted a certain period of time. Um, and then if they went too, too high, that did not help as, well, as much, okay? Not only get strengthening, but you get pain relief. So that's, I think, I want to focus on. So the way you get the patient to fire the glute medium and min and not the other muscles is you ask them to imagine they're doing a split. That's one of the, the words they say if you try to like, like imagine pushing your legs out and, 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 and out like you're trying to make a split versus lifting it up. It's a different activating pattern. And slowly ramp up the contraction and focus on the glute, meat, and min. And then use palpation. Palpate the glute, meat, and min. And even you see over here, if her thumbs are in the glute, meat, and min, she can feel where she's activating, right? You don't want these muscles down here activating. You want these muscles up here activating on top of the um, glute mean, glute mean region. And they use a lot of bridge exercises and they do bridge with the abduction. But again, slowly activate those uh, contractions. So this is one of the studies, one of the studies that they, that they looked at, patella tendinopathy, they use 70% max voluntary isometric contraction of the uh, quads. They held over 45 to 60 seconds. They repeat it four times, several times a day. And this provided the almost complete relief of patella tendon pain immediately and for at least 45 minutes. Where isotonic exercises only had a small uh, transient effect on pain. So if you get nothing else from this presentation, 
Maybe adding in isometric contractions is depending on the patient and what they can handle, how much load they can handle, which we'll talk about. Try the isometric contractions for pain relief. What they did in this other study I read that they actually had the patient do isometric contractions every three hours and that would eliminate their pain and they and were able to tolerate pain better. And of course they'd tailor that back over time. That really helped. So then they add in low velocity, high load abduction. So you can do it upright or you can do it in a squat position. But the key is, if you notice, you're stabilizing on the leg that the problem is. So this is the problem leg, right? You wait, you set the weight over that leg, you keep the pelvis st stable, and then you pull your leg out and in, okay? The first few weeks of the, of the treatment plan are focused on load management and movement technique, making sure that pelvis doesn't drop or shift, because if it does, you go into adduction. Once you go into adduction, you're increasing that compressive force of the tendon. And then you progress to heavier loading, but really heavier loading. And the question is, how heavy are we going with our patients? The reason, the way you pick your load is by perceived exertion. They get up to seven out of 10. So if you have a 90 year old and you're doing a heavier load, it's what their seven out of 10 is. Very different than your 30 year old. So that's how you're getting, but go to your heavier loads. But the important part is, don't forget about domes, delayed onset of muscle soreness. Usually the tendinopathies are sore 24, maybe 48 hours later. So always check in your notes, say, hey, we'll check next time, we'll see how you, how you responded. If they responded well, increase them. I think the tendency in PT is to go slow and don't push too hard, but the heavier loads of tendinopathies really are helpful. Can I ask so, you again? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. When you talk about RPE um, and talk about how seven out of 10 is kind of the sweet spot. Um, yeah. I like that, um, but my question is, are you starting at a seven out of 10? Cause obviously as they exercise oh. that RPE will go up. Um, is that your starting point? Like, Hey, I want this to start as a seven out of 10. Do you want to finish at that point? Um, does that make sense what I'm asking? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, first of all, let me make sure I'm clear. You're getting to a seven out of 10, right? It doesn't okay. mean first of all, Hey, you're starting, you're okay. starting your heavy loads there, right? It okay. might be that the first day you do it, you're, you're on three out of 10, then you're five out of 10, then you go seven out of 10. But when they feel that they're on rep, you know, seven, and now their perceived exertion is a nine, it's uh, too heavy. Okay, so you it. really want to get to reach a seven. So it might be if you're, if you're load, if you want to get, now this is, look, we don't, we're not big on like, hey, I want to do eight reps. I want to do five reps. And that's really for strength. The certain patients do well with that, but we're more on the you know, let's try to increase repetition, uh, 30 repetitions, because we want to get motor control, um, endurance, because that's how our body functions in endurance. We, we don't do three sets of 10 like they used to do back in the 80s. Uh, but this is where you can. And it might be three sets of 10 because you're doing heavy loads. And by a 10th repetition, they should be a seven out of 10. Okay. I, I didn't read that correctly. That makes sense. I probably didn't explain it correctly, <laughs> but that, that's what it, it, it has to reach seven out of 10. But it's a great question. Carter is a question machine. Randy, I don't know what's going on with you, Randy. You're really not taking your, uh, your job seriously. Um, so I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm letting you know. I know. I know. I'm, I'm expecting questions the whole time from you, though, Randy. <laughs> okay. So take home points. Palpation. If it's not tender, it's probably not a gluteal tendinopathy, right? Faders with resistance is the test you're doing. Remember, flex up, adduct, excellently rotate passively, and then resist hip internal rotation. That's going to get you your, uh, your positive test for glutenopathy. The most specific test, single leg stance, looking for pain. Notice and write down if there's a, uh, a difference in the ability to control, because control is very important, but not for necessary diagnosis. Uh, we talked a little about this, but when a patient comes in, they talk about um, like their gait pattern. We look at that. The main things we're looking at is avoiding hip adduction. We want to decrease a hard heel strike and avoid pelvis drop. Now, I'm sure in the next presentation, uh, when we talk about running mechanics, we'll hear this again. But these are really important. You know, avoid the hip adduction, decrease the heel strike, and avoid pelvis drop or shifting. Now, you know, I want to go through this really quick because I think it's very important to understand and our goals in PT. But a patient walks in, how many patients have you walked in and said, hey, have you noticed you actually cross over midline? And they're like, no, what do you mean? Like, yeah, your legs literally cross over the line in the middle. And you hear how hard your steps are and your pelvis is shifting. 
They have no idea they're doing that. I know you see this to your patients. There's four stages. Now, actually, I'll give my wife credit. Nicole goes through this with her myofunctional therapy. But this is the four stages, right? At first, the patient comes in, and they're not even conscious of their dysfunctional movement, right? So they come in, they have no idea they're doing it wrong, right? So your first stage you get to is make them conscious of their dysfunctional movement pattern. So, hey, let's look at this tape in the middle, in the middle of here. I'll, I'll put a band down in the middle. Just when you're walking, try not to hit it. They're like, oh my God, my, I am crossing over. And listen for your heel strike. Like, do you hear that loud sound when you're stepping? You know, so you, you make them notice. So now they're conscious of their dysfunction, right? Then they come in next time, your question is, hey, do, do you recognize your dysfunction or do you recognize, not use dysfunction, do you recognize that you're crossing over? Do you recognize your heel strike? And they say, yeah, I did. Well, now they're in stage two, which is recognizing, which is being conscious of their dysfunction, right? Stage three is they change that to proper function, right? So now they're actually conscious. They're saying, you know, I'm thinking about it and I, and I'm, I have to consciously think how many times has your patient said that? I have, con I have to consciously think about keeping my legs apart, about not crossing over, not striking hard, not dropping my pelvis. They think about it. That's stage three. We're not there yet. Because the goal has to be to go to unconscious proper function. That is your goal as a PT. They have to come in and say, you know what? I'm not even thinking about it anymore. And that's when, when Randy asked me that question last time when we talked about the foot. And she said, hey, do you do exercises for the next six months? I said, well, you know, I should say yes, but the answer is no. Because once you go to an unconscious, automatic, proper functional position, you no longer gonna have your pain. So that's the key with gait, is get them to that unconscious, proper function. And then we want to, again, minimize that sustained, repetitive, loaded hip adduction. This is key, but the ES is making sure they're not going to hip adduction because that causes that compressive force of the greater trochanter. And then exercise should include the sustained isometrics um, with abduction. So we get some pain relief and also strength and function in the beginning stages. And um, you gradually progress the tensile loading toward low velocity, heavy load abduction. And that'll improve the conditioning of the abductor muscle tennis complex and load bearing capacity. And you hear about tendon rehab, it's all load bearing capacity. That's what we're talking about. Making the tendon be able to handle a heavier load. Uh, functional retraining, you can do double leg, for example, squats. You can go to single leg lunges or squats. Um, making sure that you're not adducting. That is the key right there during dynamic loads. And you can use the uh, 3D infra analysis to make sure they're not doing that. That's the great part about not just checking the range of motion, but checking to make sure when they're using speed, are they going to hip adduction? And the infra analysis will tell you that. An exercise should be done in slight hip abduction. Every time you have them more abducted than adducted, right? Because that increases again the compressive load. I know I keep saying the same thing over and over again, but I just want to make sure we get that. Uh, just to end, they had another study a leap study they went through and just looked at different patients. And they compared patients that had exercise and education versus cortisone injections versus just a pamphlet with education. So the pamphlet, 30% of patients had relief and felt like they attained their goal in eight weeks. Great. Some education helps. Cortisone injections, they had good pain relief after eight weeks, but not as good at 52 weeks. But exercise and education, like the education I showed you, had superior outcomes. Right away at eight weeks, they had less pain than the, than the cortisone injection group. And at the 52 weeks, they had 80% successful outcomes. Pain started at five out of 10, and by eight weeks dropped to 1.5 out of 10. So by far, the best group was the exercise and education group. And what's missing from that? Manual therapy. They did not even do manual therapy. Our goal, our baseline should be 80% of our patients get better. That's our baseline. This doing just this, 80% get better. When we add in the manual therapy techniques and our special techniques like PRI, DNS, SFMA, uh, ART, um, cupping, we add these things in to change biomechanics, we should get better than 80%. We want to go to 95 or 100%. That's really our goal. So that's the presentation. Any questions? 
I have a question actually. I should have asked it um, earlier probably. Did they mention specific parameters for dosage in there as far as how long they're holding the isometric contraction and how many times they're doing that? Um, I showed you that one study where they did that. That was for the patella tendinopathy that was in there. And I'll send this out. Everybody will have the video of this too. Um, they didn't talk about about dosage as far as like exactly what they did isometric wise. But what they did talk about, the most important part is it's 100% pain free. There should never, ever, ever, ever be any pain when you're doing an isometric contraction. So the idea is that on that one study that we looked at, they did longer holds, right? 45 seconds. Um, and those patients did very well. So you know, when we think isometrics, oh, I'll do five seconds. Well, if you have your really reactive patient, yeah, you do five second isometrics and you start with that. But, but the studies all point to longer isometric holds at, a, at that study was at 25%, right? But could be higher of resistance. So I think you have to, you have to dose that properly with your patient if they uh, are really reactive and extremely sensitive. And then when they come in next time, hey, how do you do? No, no increased pain? Great. Let's go up. And then you increase your, your time first, and then you increase your resistance later. Gil, can I challenge what you just said? <laughs> of course. Um, and it's not so much challenging. It's just that um, in, in the reactive stage, I agree, like, don't push into pain. Um, um, but down the road, um, I've seen other research that says you can push into kind of mild amounts of pain, you know, you know even – you know, zero, three, maybe four out of 10 levels of pain and discomfort. Um, as long as they're not, again, super reactive. I've heard in red studies that you could push into that kind of pain level threshold. Did it, did it say specifically that they, they just wanted the isometrics to be pain-free? They wanted all of the exercise to be 100% pain-free. Okay. Uh, if you're talking about like a higher level athlete, mm -hmm. that might be a different, uh, a different patient uh, that we're looking at. And that could be okay. But in, 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 in this, what they're doing is, I know, I know what studies are referring to. What they're saying is, if you're causing pain, you're compressing that tensile with that compressive and tensile load and possible shearing load. And that's going to increase uh, tissue damage the, to the matrix. That's what they're saying. Don't tell the patient there's any tendon damage. If you talk to the patient, you say, hey, what we're doing is we're strengthening a tendon. The tendon's supposed to be working. We're, you know, we're making it stronger. But I, I think it's a different uh, type of patient that you're talking about with these reactive patients. They would not do well if you have more of an acute or a highly reactive patient and you push into pain. Most likely, the next time they come in, they're like, "Oh man, I'm I'm hurting." But if they aren't and you want to test them, you could do that. But just pick your patients well. Yeah, I agree, and I think the reactive ones obviously being careful not to but um but i mean i think as long as you kind of pay attention to their response the next day or within that 24-hour window um i i i've pushed into some pain and they've responded well but um but again i i agree the reactive ones for sure just play it safe um yeah yeah i think i think that, that's great and if you feel comfortable doing that i'm all for it i've done that many times it's worked out well but i would say in general we wouldn't do that and Carter, I really love your man tank that you're busting out. It's really hot in my house. Sorry. <laughs> Kale, can I ask yeah. a quick question? Yeah, Chris. Good, good. So um, were all of those isometrics done with like the leg in a neutral position? Would we want to experiment shortening that muscle group? Uh, great question. So the beginning stages in this study, they just had them doing – neutral but slightly hip abducted so you're saying is would you want to abduct further well that might they might be less reactive with that muscle shortened right exactly so you have right. to be in a neutral maybe shorten them a little yep i agree would 100%. we ever want to do an isometric with the muscle group in a lengthened position i know that would compress the area but do we want to strengthen that range or do we just not want them to go there no great great excellent question so this is, this is grading the stages. So the answer is yes, you definitely would do that if you have a patient that's gonna to have to be in that position. If you have a, you know, uh, somebody that's never gonna be in an adductive position, then yeah, maybe you don't, but, but most people would. So the last stage, this is my opinion, this is not the study, they don't even discuss that. But in my opinion, you have to load the tendon in every position it's gonna go into. 
if you don't load that tendon in the dysfunctional position at some point, you won't be able to handle that load. So without a doubt in my mind, you have to load the tendon in that adducted position, but that's toward the end. So I would do a uh, hip abducted position first, then go more to neutral, and then go to adduction, and then function. They have to move through, especially with athletes. There's no question about that. Maybe your older grandma, maybe you wouldn't do that. You want to keep them out of that position. But without, without question, your athletes, you have to do that. And then even with like the no stretching thing, I feel like at the end of that stage, that muscle group is likely still to be tighter than the other side. And you would probably want to get that equal bilaterally, wouldn't you? Another good question. So my philosophy on stretching is that when you're taking a tissue and stretching it, what are you really doing? So what you'd be doing, what you hope you're doing is your stretches are 30 seconds. And if your 30 seconds are greater, you're elongating collagen. And if you elongate that collagen, that muscle belly will be more flexible, right? Will allow, will allow more mobility. However, what really controls that mobility is tone. So would I, if I had a choice, would I rather stretch a muscle and maybe tear collagen? Yes, if the problem was the collagen was deformed because of trauma. So for example, if somebody had a baseball hit their glute me, glute min, right? No question that there's trauma there. It bled, it scarred down. I'd wanna do deep soft tissue work. I would wanna do ART. I would wanna uh, do stretching because that's a trauma to a tissue, right? But if I have a patient who the reason why they're not as flexible is because of hypertonicity, because that glute me, glute min is so toned up, stretching will impact tone. So instead, we do our techniques like um, looking at motor points, doing muscle inhibition techniques, contract, relax techniques. So we look at more uh, neurological tone versus just stretching. So that's my approach to it. Doesn't mean that stretching is terrible, but I have found over time that I get much better results when I look at changing tone. Now, if I change tone and it doesn't change their mobility, then go for stretching. No question about that, but I would go after the tone first. All right. Great questions. Anybody else? I have another question. Is, oh, sorry. No. Go, go ahead, Randy. Uh, and I was gonna ask this maybe like obviously different in managing the specific patient, but I had some of these type of patients that end up, hey, we gotta send you back to the doctor, direct access point. Fortunately, they end up in and ortho hands we work closely with, and they're gonna go maybe TRP or cortisone. A lot of them that might not be in that route, and they're like gonna go back to the doctor and they'll get that cortisone right away. Is there any other current research you have that support? Here's how the patient could be more aware of differential diagnosing to help their doctors make sure they don't just go, oh, it's been a while, sure, let's inject it with cortisone, which can make the tendon even worse. It was a little blurry. I don't know if I got everything, but I'll give my answer and you can tell me what I, what I missed. Um, so, I mean, as we know, cortisone can be effective. And in that study, in the short terms, it was effective. What we also know is that cortisone over time, multiple cortisone injections degrade the tissue. So if we're going to have a patient, and I've had patients go in, like, ah, every six months I do a cortisone injection. I'm like, oh, hate to be you. Uh, because that is more likely to have a tendon tear. Right, so really we wanna educate them. There's a lot of evidence out there, <laughs> a lot of research and, and, and everybody in the know realizes that multiple injections are going to possibly cause more issues. The other way I like to look at it is I try to educate my patients say, look, why are you having this inflammatory issue? What is the problem? And for example, in this case, oh, well, it's because you're constantly adducted. You're constantly pulling this this tendon over this bone over and over and over again, it's rubbing and rubbing and rubbing, and you're just wearing it down from the undersurface, the underside of that tendon, you're just wearing it down. So what are you gonna do? So you're gonna put a needle in there, you're gonna, you're gonna uh, put cortisone in, and it's gonna calm it down, and you're gonna feel better, but it's not gonna change your rubbing. You'll keep rubbing, you just won't feel it. So if anything, you're causing more of a problem because you're getting rid of the symptom, which is inflammation, but you're rubbing it over and over and over again, so you're tearing that tendon further. Um, again, trying to use the word tearing because patients get freaked out, but that's essentially what's happening. So if you explain to them the, the pathomechanics aren't changing. 
Wouldn't you rather feel the pain, change the mechanics, get rid of the stimulus and get rid of the pain versus continually inject and possibly have more, much more significant issues? Is that what you're asking, Randy? Partially. The other component was like, what it might be too broad of a question it might be an appropriate timeline of we're doing what we think is correctly but prp might be a good intervention because the tendon is still not responding well like that might be case specific but when you know timeline wise healing wise um so for me uh based on research i would give yourself a three-month window it doesn't mean you can't do prp right away right PRP can't hurt. There's not downtime really. So um, you can have a PRP injection and add that to the mix. Nothing's wrong with that. Um, some patients do well. The evidence, like, uh, like we've heard, it's just not really there to say that PRP is the end all be all and it helps everybody. But um, anecdotally, people feel it does help. There's multiple factors that could be involved. So I would say for PRP, if a patient wants to get it and a doctor wants to do it, sure. You're not degrading tissue that way. Cortisone, a whole different story. So if you want to add in PRP, it's fine. I usually tell a patient, we go through loading phases. At some point, we need to get strengthening. How many weeks does it take to strengthen a muscle? What is sick. What? Eight. What? Eight. Eight. Yeah, eight weeks, right? Six weeks, eight weeks in that range. So you're not going to get, you're not going to get changes from strength for about eight weeks, right? And how long does it take to get a motor control change? A minute, right? I mean, you got a motor control change immediately. Why do patients come in in pain and leave pain free? They could change their motor control systems through changing that stressor. So, so you could change motor control right away. So patients could feel better right away, right? But eight weeks about is, that six to eight week window is where you actually get a true strength change, but then you need function. So you probably need two to four weeks to improve that function. So you have carryover. So that three month window is a good window to look at to have patients be patient, but these patients in the study don't get better for six to eight months, some of them. So it's not, tendinopathies are not easy. Do not expect, unless it's a biomechanical issue and you change the biomechanics. So you change that stressor right away. Don't expect a quick change. It was a damaged tendon. It could take six to eight months to get better with, with, with treatment. Okay. So I think that hopefully does that answer your question, the realistic goals? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's super helpful. Sometimes they come in and they've already tolerated things for so long. Once you've explained it to them, they're like, oh, that makes sense. And now I expect better fast. And right. so sometimes knowing the right time to say, hey, invest your money in this PRP, which can or can't be accessible. It's like hard to kind of know when to guide them in the right way, especially if they don't end up with the position we work super closely with. And I'm like, oh, you're in the best hands. Yada, yada. So, yes, thank you. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All awesome questions. Okay, well, I got one. Michael. Can these tendinopathies uh, occur at the same time as maybe structural pathology? So like, uh, can you have gluteal tendinopathy and maybe like FAI at the same time? Or is one usually the cause of another? And then second question, if so, which one do you treat first? <laughs> you only have one question, Michael. You only have one. <laughs> um, okay, I mean, great question. So yes, you could have both, absolutely. Because if you have FAI, femoral acetabular impingement. Now, what could that be due to, right? That could be due to a, let's just take one, one route. That could be due to, to a, either a mobility issue in the hip or a poor stability issue. So let's go to stability route. So let's just say that you can't control your pelvis on the left, so you're constantly banging up against your femur and you either, you could have, remember, those deformities could be a, a cam or a pincer deformity. When you have stability, now you're banging those over and over and over again, right? So you have that happening. Well, you, while you're also not controlling that hip, your gluteal tendon is trying to stabilize and it can't, right? And your TFL and vas lateralis and upper fibers glute max are trying to stabilize and it can't. So now they have a tendinopathy. So seeing this in isolation is actually probably not that common, right? We already saw lumbar spine pathology, 35% 
is comes along with this pathology. So without a doubt, you could have both. And the question is, what do you treat? Is that your? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, this is this is a clinical decision, right? Um, it, treating one is almost like treating the other in some ways. But like, for example, if you talk to certain people, they're going to tell you, oh, we'll go PRI, 100% Pulse Restoration Institute. That's what we do, right? We, we make sure that the pelvis is able to control movement, that you're back on that side, that you're not going to cause excess compression, that you're changing sides. I mean, without a doubt, they'll be like, oh, that's it, right? And then you'll have other people say, hey, no, 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 no. You know, you have a rectus femoris that's super tight, that's pulling the, that, that, um, pelvis, that pelvis forward, and that's causing more compression. So you treat that. But whatever you're treating, the goal is to not have that pelvis drop. Trendelenburg, you sit on that left leg, and if your pelvis drops, you're gonna have maybe both problems. And then maybe a lumbar facet problem on that same side as well. So you're treating the movement pattern dysfunction, and then both will get better. Okay. You could add an isometrics. Now, let me be clear. On that study, I think it goes to Matt F's question. What they did was, just so you realize, they did five days a week of exercise. They did three days a week of um, isometrics. Um, uh, I'm sorry, two days a week of heavy load isometrics and three days a week of light load. So they went back and forth. So they, they never actually did no exercise. And I think that the key take home point is don't baby your patients. Don't have a patient laying on the table and you just dig it in their glute knee the whole time, you know, they need to load that. You can inhibit tone, you can facilitate tone, but you want to make sure you're loading them, make sure you're stabilizing them, make sure function improves. That will help everything. Okay, so any other questions, Michael? Great question. Okay, thank you. I got one real quick. So I know they yeah. said palpation was real important, you know, like make sure we're on the tendon, but a lot of times, Back then in school, you'd be like, if you touch the uh, greater trochanter and or they're lying on their side, it's a bursa. What about like enthesopathies or, you know, or like even with the knee, are we, how are we treating that compared to like uh, um, tendinopathies? So the enthesopathy and tendinopathy, uh, I think you're treating similar. I think the, the key is that when you're loading, you're, you're being more careful um, with the uh, enthesopathy when you're at the tendon bone junction where you really want to make sure you're taking into consideration pain tolerance you know make sure there's no soreness afterwards because what you don't want it is an avulsion right mm -hmm. so if somebody does have an enthesopathy and you add speed onto that and you all of a sudden that remember when you add speed and lack of control that's when you have trauma right so if you want to add speed on make sure it's controlled if you want to add uh, you know, you know, anything else, make sure it's controlled movement, but, but you don't add speed on to enthesopathy patients until much later. Uh, that would be really important. But yeah, I mean, we were taught in PT school too. Oh, you push here up oh, bursitis and that's inflammatory. So just, you know, leave it alone. It'll get better with rest. Well, you can see in that study, 30% of patients got better with education only, right? That's only 30%, 70% didn't get better at all with just rest. So um, usually patients don't get better with just rest. That's, that's a, a false information that I think we heard years ago. Kill question. Uh, I want to make sure I understand this. An enthesopathy, that's just a tendinopathy at the insertion. That's tendon to bone, right? Instead of exactly. the junction? Correct. Okay. Good question. Anybody else? A quick question on loading tests. Yeah. So you mentioned like the single leg stance test is a really good test. So I'm assuming that's like a low load test. Are high load tests not as good at assessing gluteotendinopathy or, or are they just not necessary? Good question. This is my opinion. I think what happens, you get a patient coming in and this sort of goes back to Carter's question. Normally they're reactive. So if you were to do a standing test for 30 seconds, normally that would cause their pain because if they're, if they're going to come to PT, Usually they're like, man, I got to get in there. Now on the patient, because they're desperate, it hurts. Uh, for the patient that we were talking about Carter, that's a higher level patient, let's say a triathlon runner, like that's a totally different story, right? They're going to stand on one leg and be like, this is cake. I mean, this is nothing. Then you do a hop test, right? That, remember when you hop, you're adding three times to five times your weight. 
If you weigh, weigh 100 pounds, that's three to 500 pounds of weight when you jump, depending on how you jump. So load tests are great. But would I load test a 70 year old person who's telling me their, their hip hurts? No, these are patients who already have lateral hip pain and you just want to know if it's a gluteal tendinosis or sorry, uh, tendinopathy or something else. They stand on one leg and they have uh, pain down their back of their leg. That's probably not that. It's probably a lumbar spine thing or something else. So we're just trying to differentiate with that load test. So that answer your question, Robin? Um, kind of. So what if they're positive for like um, the low load, but not the high load test? Would you still call that gluteal tendinopathy or is that something else? They're positive on their low load test, but they can do, uh, do like a I, single leg hop with no pain. Yeah, I would say if that's the case, they're, it'd be unlikely for them to be able to do that. But if they did, they must be having some kind of compensation pattern where they're not moving through the glutes or using something else. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're hamstring dominant and they're really like going into more of a squat where they lean back and they're more hamstring or there'd be some reason why, because that really that presentation would be rare to do a single leg load and be painful and you'll hop and have no pain at all. So I would say they're cheating somehow. Uh, but remember that test in itself is not good enough. You need to cluster all your tests together. So any other yeah. questions? Thank you. Sure. This has been like the most questions we ever had in a Zoom meeting. I love it. I actually enjoyed that. A anybody else? Okay. All right. Well, it's I not talk a question, but I. Oh. oh. <laughs> Go ahead, Randy. It's not a question, but I just, I like the, just the topic itself reminds me of. I've had quite a few patients that end up with this, this in conjunction with some type of like fibroid or ovarian cyst. So they're like mid the right age, maybe pre uh, hormonal changes for females. Uh, but it's basically that like about to go through menopause or just going through something and have some type of issue where their pelvic uh, mechanics are not changing or changing well. Uh, and it's kind of like a little extra step to get them in with also the right doctor that they're not just in with ortho. They end up sometimes needing the removal of those in conjunction with the treatment of the tendinopathy to like fully get better. Just in through. Really. That's great. Um, yeah, I mean, remember, the majority of these patients, the higher risk is above 40, females above 40. So it could also be that, you know, that might be one of the reasons why. So um, great point. Uh, I have nothing to say about that, but I, I, I trust you on that one, Randy. Anybody else? I have one more. Um, All right, man tank, go ahead. It's, it's, <laughs> um, it's you, you initially talked about bursa. Um, and just how the majority of people are more gluteal tendinopathy and previously um, they were classified as more of a, a personal pathology. Um, any, um, and we focus more on the tendinopathy stuff, but any in terms either like diagnostically or treatment wise, um, how you would differentiate um, maybe like treating a personal pathology versus the tendinopathy, obviously biomechanics and compression are gonna be more of a focus for a bursal tendinopathy. Um, but anything diagnostically um, that you can think of to help differentiate between the two, because palpation is obviously not as great of a indicator between them. Um, I think one of them is pain at rest, just, just a deep ache in the lateral hip at rest doing nothing, right? That's one of the signs. But here's the thing. If you have a bursal irritation, if it's not from a compressive load, uh, let me go back. If it's not from um, tactile compression. So it could be that this person is laying down on their side seven hours a day when they're awake and all night long watching TV. And that's why they have this bursal irritation. That makes sense. So what's gonna help them is gonna be the education portion. How are they sleeping? Where's their legs? You know, that will change that bursal issue. So, um, uh, so I think the key is that that will help just with the bursa and the tendinopathy by changing that compressive load will change. Okay. So, so it's, objective exam is probably important here. Yes. Yeah, definitely. But you're really treating gluteal tendinopathy, which will help the bursa anyway. Any other questions? 
All right. I'm going to stop that.